Hello, I'm Shelby County Sheriff Floyd Bonner, and I'm excited to introduce a new training initiative to serve our citizens. The Tennessee governor signed a new state law allowing for permitless carries of handguns effective July 1. However, there is no training requirement to accompany this law. Therefore, the sheriff's office is offering free handgun safety classes, but no live weapon fire. The class will be taught by my certified firearms instructors, the same instructors who teach our deputy sheriffs. I invite you to learn about safe and proper weapon handling techniques, recommended ways to carry and secure your handguns, and some specifics about state law when you can and cannot use deadly force. The choice to carry a handgun is a major decision in your life and it can affect the people around you if you mishandle your weapon. I want the people who choose to carry a firearm to understand the fundamentals and proper handgun safety and to learn state laws concerning the use of deadly force. You can check our Sheriff's Office webpage, our Facebook and Twitter page for class dates and times, or you can call or text our training academy at 901-562-3059. Thank you. All right, good morning. Uh, what we have for you today is a PowerPoint presentation. I'm gonna take you through that and uh, read you some information. There's some photos in here to better explain some stuff. I'll hands-on demo some stuff for you so you get a better understanding of it. And if you have any questions along the way about something, a, a particular word or the definition or a better explanation on one of the slides, make sure you throw your hand up and ask that question. Uh, like the sheriff said, there's no dumb question. Uh, don't be scared to ask that question. Five other people probably want to know that same answer. So make sure you ask and we'll get it figured out for you. Uh, let me find my clicker and we'll get going. All right, so by show of hands, is there anybody that's never fired a gun before? Legal or otherwise? <laughs> okay. So everybody shot something before, right? Uh, has everybody shot a handgun before? Anybody not shot a handgun before? Okay. Uh, do we have any gun owners by show of hands? Awesome. Good deal. All right, and we had about, I think, half of you had had a permit class. Is that correct? Okay, good deal. All right, so we're going to, the topics on this are going to be basic gun safety, which applies to any gun, and it applies to everybody no matter what your skill level is. Uh, we'll talk about um, modes of carry, how you could carry it on your person, how you could store it safely, uh, just some uh, situational awareness, basic parking lot safety, uh, general safety tips and how guns function and operate, how the gun functions itself mechanically and how the shooter operates the gun as well. <clears throat> Owning and or carrying a firearm is a great responsibility. You must remember firearm safety is paramount and there can be no exceptions. The subject of deadly force is not one of our topics today. However, you could receive this information in a defensive firearms class. Just remember, for deadly force to be justified, there must be a threat of serious bodily injury or death. The use of deadly force is not justified for the protection of valuables or property. Does that make sense to everybody? So I'm going to give you something a little further on that to maybe answer some questions in your mind. Uh, a lot of times when we're talking about deadly force, people want to, they want us to make up scenarios. All right, well, what if this happened? What if this happened? And you could take the same scenario and change one minute detail in it and it changes the whole situation. Does that make sense? So what I'm gonna do is give you kind of a checklist for the criteria that needs to be in place for deadly force to be justified. And then you can take that checklist and apply it to any scenario you could dream up, okay? So, and it's, it's a short list, it's only three things. Okay, so for deadly force to be justified, there needs to be the means, the ability, and the intent. And that's our checklist. 
So the means is simply by what means would they try to hurt you or kill you? What would they use as a weapon? That's what the means is talking about. So give me an example of something that could be used as a weapon. What is it? Shout it out. Knife, kitchen knife, gun, obviously. What else? What is it? Mace. Yeah. Baseball bat. A lot of different stuff. It could be anything. I could, I could pick up this table and beat you over the head with it. If I beat you to death with it, then that becomes a murder weapon. Is that right? So the means is talking about by what means are they going to try to do you harm or kill you. Okay? So that's checkbox number one. Number two is the ability. And that means physically could they do it? Meaning does the weapon that they have that they're going to use, are they close enough or do they physically are they able to get to you to use that weapon on you? Does that make sense? So if I was across a parking lot with a gun, I could reach out and touch you with a gun from a distance. But if I was standing way across the street with a baseball bat threatening you, then physically I wouldn't have the ability to attack you immediately to where you would be in imminent danger. Does that make sense to you? So it has to be immediate and fixing to happen right then. For it to check that box also so we have the means and the ability that's number one and number two and then the last one is the intent the intent is have I displayed actions that let you know that I'm gonna try to harm you or kill you okay so just a real basic uh, a real basic scenario as an example if we have a verbal altercation and I pull my shirt up, you see a pistol, I put my hand on it, I bring the gun out and point it at you. Have I checked all those boxes showing you that it's okay to use deadly force? What do you think? Do I have the means to do it? I got the gun. Do I have the ability? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm this close, I could, I could hit you easily. Have I shown the intent? Yeah, because I drew the gun and I pointed it right at her. So that checks the boxes on our checklist. Does that make sense to you? So the means, the ability, the intent. Um, if you take that checklist and apply it to whatever scenario you could come up with and you can find the answer. Sometimes it's tricky when you add different variables and things like that. But just remember, it's always got to be for the protection of life and not property. Does that make sense to everybody? All right. Anybody have any questions on that? Very well. If you think up something as we're going along, what you got? I, did, I, I was thinking about something. Is it also uh, the uh, ability to avoid, if you had the opportunity to avoid it, in other words, if I'm up to you or someone's in the, coming in my house, you just sit there and just wait on them, would they hold that against you saying you had an opportunity to retreat or go somewhere else? All right, so, so what he's asking is, I don't know if you can hear him, but what he's asking is basically do we have to retreat? And it's kind of a state-by-state -state basis. Tennessee is a stand-your-ground state, which means I do not have to make an attempt to run away from you rather than use defensive force. Does that make sense? I can stand my ground and defend myself. Some states require you to make an attempt to retreat first before you resort to deadly force. Now, on that note, if you could always avoid using deadly force, by all means, do what you can to avoid it. Okay, we don't want to use deadly force just because legally we can, you know, because there's a lot of stuff that's going to be the aftermath of the result of that. If you can avoid it, by all means, avoid it, but you don't have to try to run away. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? Okay. Uh, anybody else? If you think of something as we're going along, um, Catch us on break, one of the instructors in the black shirts. Catch us on break and hit us up with that question and we'll get an answer for you, okay? All right, so gun safety. <clears throat> there are four basic safety rules that apply to all firearms. They must be followed at all times. Rule number one, treat every gun as if it were loaded. All right, so can anybody tell me which one of those is loaded and which one is not? Just by what you see. No. And if these were all mine 
and I had them laid out on the table and I was going to pick one up to take it in the room and clean it. I'm not going to try to remember which one. Is it loaded? Is it not? I'm just going to assume that they're all loaded and I'll handle it accordingly. And that way I'll always be sure to treat it like I'm supposed to. Does that make sense? Treat every gun as if it were loaded. We should assume all of these guns are loaded until proven otherwise. Treating every gun like it's loaded will help increase your gun safety mindset. And that's something you need to have really dialed in is every time you put your hand on a gun to go shoot it, to pick it up and clean it, to put it in a holster, whatever the case, when you know you're going to pick that gun up, you need to be mindful and you need to respect it just like it's loaded, even if you know you just unloaded it. We at the range, the instructors, we work on guns all day. Uh, people bring them in. We service them, all kind of stuff. And... I can pick one up, safety check it. I know it's safe and empty. I do whatever I need to. I pass it off to Instructor Shields. First thing he's going to do when I hand it to him, he's going to take it and safety check it as well. He just saw me check it. He knows it's empty. But he's still going to check it. Does that make sense? Yes. I mean, why would you not? It doesn't, it doesn't cost anything. It takes two seconds to check it. So we want to we stay in that safety mindset. Rule number two, always keep the muzzle pointed in a safe direction. If some of you want to know what the muzzle is, I'm going to show you. The muzzle is the front end of the barrel where the projectile will exit. Here are some examples of a muzzle. Top left, we have a semi-auto handgun. Bottom right, we have a revolver. That's pointing to the muzzle. That's the front end of the, the barrel where the projectile is going to come out. That's the business end. That's the end that you don't want to be on. And, okay. Here's an example of what the muzzle looks like on a rifle or a shotgun. So basically any firearm that has a barrel is going to have a muzzle on it. Okay, and we need to treat it accordingly. We need to keep that muzzle pointed in a safe direction. Now what I have here is a training gun. It's called a blue gun because it's blue, but even if it was a different color, we would probably refer to it as a blue gun. Uh, this is synonymous in the gun industry as a safe training gun. This is just a molded piece of plastic, doesn't have any moving parts, it doesn't have a fire mechanism. So when we train with these, we're training grip, how to handle the gun, we actually point them at each other in different scenarios because it's a safe weapon. Does that make sense? So the muzzle, I want to treat it, or I want to keep the muzzle pointed in a safe direction. So if I had to pick this gun up off of the table, in a setting just like this, I would do my best to get that muzzle away from the direction of everybody. Does that make sense to you? And then you need to imagine that there's a laser coming out of this muzzle and anything it crosses is gonna burn it. Okay, that's, that's a good way to remember that. Always keep that muzzle pointed in a safe direction. I don't wanna point it at anybody that, don't, that doesn't need it pointed at and I don't wanna point it at myself. I don't want to point it at my body parts, and I don't want to point it at anybody uh, that it doesn't need pointing at. Does everybody understand that on the muzzle? Uh, rule number three, always keep your finger off the trigger until you're ready to shoot. And when we're talking about finger, really it's all fingers, but, but mostly we're talking about the trigger finger, the one that's going to work the trigger. We want to keep it off the trigger until we're ready to shoot. Now, ready to shoot means you've made the decision to shoot the gun and you have the muzzle pointed at the target. So, just to give you some clarification on that, if I'm at the gun range with my buddies and we're sharing a lane, we're taking turns shooting the target, we've got our guns laid over here, so my turn's, my turn's up to shoot. I'm ready to shoot because it's my turn. That doesn't mean since I'm ready to shoot, I can go and put my finger on the trigger and go to my spot and then start shooting the gun because what? I don't have what on target? The muzzle, right? So I would take myself with my trigger finger straight on the frame. I would take myself to my shooting point. When I'm at my shooting point and the muzzle is on target, then I could put my finger on the trigger and proceed to shoot. Does that make sense? So we have... Uh, we have muzzle, muzzle in a safe direction and we have finger off the trigger until we're ready to shoot. Those two kind of go hand in hand. 
Here's some examples of good finger discipline. We call it finger discipline. You've disciplined your trigger finger to stay out of that trigger guard, off that trigger until you're ready to shoot. So the girl on the left, uh, she's doing something. She's taking a magazine out, putting a magazine in. I don't know from the picture, but the important thing to notice is her trigger finger. It's posted on the side of the frame. She has a good grip on the gun. Her trigger finger is nowhere near the trigger or inside the trigger guard, and that's what we want to see. Same thing on the right, the two on the right. Trigger finger is out and straight. They have not made the decision to shoot yet, so they hadn't put their finger on the trigger. Does that make sense to everybody? Right, y'all are doing great. It works for long guns too, rifles, shotguns. Doesn't matter what it is. If it's a handheld weapon, then you can have good trigger finger discipline. Rule number four, know your target and what is in its path. So identify what you're going to shoot at, know what you're going to shoot at, and make sure you know what's in the path of that bullet between you and the target and beyond. This includes in front of the target as well as beyond the target. So what about this? What do we see here? Can we shoot those targets or not? No. Because why? Because there's a dog. What else is there? My son's over there on the right. All right, don't shoot my son. But we have something in front of the target that, pre that prevents us from shooting the target, and we have something beyond the target. So that would be a no-go. What about this guy? Oh, okay. what, what about that? You're on your front porch drinking coffee. So he's obviously, either he doesn't know he hadn't had this class or he doesn't care, whatever the case. Uh, he doesn't have a good backstop, okay? He, he's not being aware of what is beyond that target because it's a neighborhood. So that's a no-go on that. This is a good backstop. This is what the guy needs to be shooting at. This is obviously somewhere you'd shoot a gun. It's got a respectable backdrop that would catch a bullet. That's another thing. It's not, it's not that you just have something to shoot at in the background. It has to be substantial enough to catch a bullet, okay? It can't be just a piece of plywood or something like that. It's got to have some meat to it. Um, if you've ever seen our range down the way, we've got a 50-point lane, which means we can accommodate 50 shooters at one time. And we have a backdrop like that, but it's taller, and it runs the whole length of that range. And that's, that's where we shoot. We've got some other ranges, and they've got a similar setup. It's going to have a backdrop like that. It's going to have a berm that would catch a round. <clears throat> Remember, once the bullet is fired from the gun, you're responsible for, for the outcome. Some handgun and rifle rounds can travel for miles. Did y'all know that? Anybody know that? that? That those bullets can go for miles. Uh, that's kind of scary. So just to recap on the four basic safety rules, treat every gun as if it were loaded. Always keep the muzzle pointed in a safe direction. Always keep your finger off the trigger till you're ready to shoot. And know your target and what is in its path. That's so important. <clears throat> in addition to these four basic safety rules, here are some other things to consider. Make sure the gun is unloaded when it's supposed to be. So if you're gonna go take a gun out of the drawer, out of your safe, out of your holster, whatever, and you want to clean it, we have to download that gun and make sure it's safe and empty before we start the cleaning process. If I was going to hand off a gun to somebody else to look at, hey, check this gun out, it needs to be safe and empty. So make sure the gun is unloaded when it's supposed to be, okay? When cleaning or working on your gun, make sure it is unloaded and safe. Move the ammunition to a completely different room so there are no mistakes. Room, uh, wherever you are, put it somewhere else so there's no mistakes. Uh, download it, make it safe, move that ammo out of there so we don't accidentally, you know, we're on the phone, we're cleaning the gun, we're starting to load something up just by habit, and all of a sudden we got a loaded gun and we're not even conscious of it because we've been on the phone or whatever the case. So try to separate the two. Choose a gun that suits your needs. Consider hand size and strength, overall body strength, skill level, physical limitations, etc. There is something out there for everybody. And I mean, there really is something out there for everybody. So 
when I say choose a gun that suits your needs, if you are looking to acquire a gun uh, legally, <laughs> uh, try to find something that fits fits your body, your hand size and strength, your your purpose for using the gun. Is it something you want to target shoot with? Do you want it for home defense? Is it something you may want to carry on your person at some point? Uh, uh, instructor BJ has a, a 500 Smith & Wesson Magnum. That is a big revolver, big nasty revolver. It's meant to shoot bears and stuff. And it wouldn't be really appropriate for everyday carry, you know, going to Kroger and stuff. You could, by the law you could, but it's not very practical, you know what I mean? Uh, it's for shooting bears. <laughs> so uh, pick something that falls in line with what you're looking for. But there really is something out there for everybody. Do you have something? Uh, also go to, a, if you're looking for something and you, you want to you put your hands on some different weapons, go to a gun store. Try to go to a reputable gun store, somebody that specializes in, in gun sales. Uh, and we have, we've got some literature for you in the back on some different websites for more information on, on what we're covering on local ranges and stuff like that. Make sure you get some of that before, when you go on break or before you leave. But try to pick a reputable uh, place that specializes in firearms. You go there, they'll let you handle some guns and feel it, and they'll give you some suggestions. If you go somewhere like that, like a, a, a place that really sells guns and that's all they do, or maybe uh, even Bass Pro where they got hunting stuff, but they got a, a real legit gun part department. Um, they're going to try to find something that fits you and fits your needs. They're not going to just try to sell you a gun. Okay? If somebody tells you about a gun shop and you get there and, and they change tires and sell tacos out the back and stuff like that, you may not get the best you know, options there. So, so be mindful about where you're looking. Uh, know your weapon and how it operates. It's important to know the mechanical features of your particular make and model. If the gun does not come with an owner's manual, check online. You can find just about anything online now. They'll have full gun manuals and stuff. You can print it off or you can just download it so you can reference that. Uh, what I'm talking about when the quotations, your particular make and model, uh, each gun could be similar, but they could have specific things that are different about it. So make sure you don't get training on your friend's gun and then just assume that you can pick yours up and carry it every day and be good to go. It may have a different feature or it may be a different size or shape or something like that. You need to get some, some feel and some knowledge of that particular gun that you plan to carry and or shoot. Does that make sense? Uh, if your firearm has a manual safety, you should utilize it properly. Also, make sure to include the use of the safety during a range practice. So a manual safety, a manual safety is what uh, Instructor Shields was talking about, uh, safety on a gun. That, a manual safety is something you physically have to turn on and off on the gun. Some handguns have them, some don't. Let me, I'll give you an example. So this is also a trainer gun. Yeah, this gun is not capable of firing. It doesn't have a fire mechanism. It's designed for what we call empty gun work or dry work, where you can handle the gun, operate it, press the trigger. It's called dry firing when the gun's empty and we're working the trigger. We can do all that stuff with this for practice for the mechanical part of it, but we can't shoot the gun because it doesn't work like that. So this is also a safe gun. I'll be using this in, in most of the demos today. But this gun, this is a Glock 17 and Glock is the name brand, 17 is the model. Just like you have a Ford is the name brand, Mustang is the model. Guns are very similar like that. They have a make and a model, and then they'll have variations of, of those. So this gun is designed with what's called passive safeties, which means those are safeties that are built into the gun that I don't have to do anything to operate. Uh, it, it basically makes the gun not fire until I've decided to press the trigger. Once I press the trigger on this gun, it starts to disengage those safeties inside the gun so the gun will shoot. Does that make sense? So those are passive safeties. I don't have to do anything to work them except pull the trigger. This is a real gun. Does anybody know what style that is? What you'd call that? <laughs> I know you know. What's that? Semi-automatic, but what more specific? If you said, anybody heard of a 1911 before? Kind of the, the first brick in the foundation of, of handguns, semi-automatic. Um, 
this gun has a manual safety. All right, and I'm going to show it to you. It's a thumb safety right here. So it also, have you heard of the term cocked and locked before? Anybody heard that? So what they're referring to and what they're referring to on that is this type of gun because the hammer is cocked. That's the way this gun has to start the shooting sequence. The hammer's cocked, but the safety is locked in place. Does that make sense? So that's cocked and locked. That's what that term is referring to. But this has a manual safety. If I wanted to fire this gun, it's never going to shoot until I disengage that safety. Does that make sense to you? So that's a manual safety. And what I'm talking about, get some practice on that at the range when you do your shooting practice. Make sure you're utilizing that safety every time you shoot that gun. You need to get into a habit of working that safety because if you always practice with the safety off and never utilize that, and then you start to carry it for self-defense or use it at home for self-defense, and you say, well, I'm gonna put the safety on. You haven't trained to disengage that safety. Does that make sense? So like uh, the sheriff was talking about when, when it hits the fan and the stress is on, you're not gonna remember to turn that safety off. You're gonna be pulling a dead trigger. So if it has a manual safety, utilize it like you're supposed to and practice using that safety like you're supposed to. All right, makes sense to everybody? Very well. All right, y'all are doing great, by the way. All right, keep all firearms secured so they are not accessible to anyone that should not have them. As the gun owner, this is your responsibility. We'll talk later on in this about some different ideas for storage on how to store them and keep them safe. Never leave an unsecured weapon in a vehicle. Use a vehicle lockbox or other method to secure it. Simply hiding it in the vehicle is not enough. So what's the, if somebody breaks into our vehicle, what's the first place they're gonna start looking for stuff? Glove box, what else? Center console, where else? Under the seat, see look, are y'all thieves or what? <laughs> but you gotta think like that. That's the way we keep it from happening, right? So, I, I, I'm, guns aside, I'm not gonna put valuables, but especially guns, well I put it in the glove box. Man, that's the first place they're looking. Console, under the seats, all that stuff. So number one, don't leave it in your vehicle, okay? If you had to, for whatever reason, try to lock that gun in a compartment, not the glove box, but somewhere, they make gun boxes and gun locks. They make boxes that have a cable that you can wrap around the seat frame that's bolted to the car and lock the, the gun in there, things like that. I mean, try to really take those extra steps to secure that weapon so it can't be stolen from that vehicle. Does that make sense? Um, we'd prefer you didn't leave it in there at all, but I'm saying if you had to, I'd rather you know how to do it than to just say, well, I'm just going gonna, gonna to put it under the floor mat. That'll work. That's not going to work. Okay. Now we got a stolen gun on the street and who knows what's going to happen. Always wear eye and ear protection during live fire practice with your weapon. So we're talking about eye protection. If you don't wear glasses, it could be sunglasses, shooting glasses. They make shooting glasses that are rated uh, for taking, taking bullet frag and things like that, ricochets and things. Uh, but really, just any kind of eye protection is, is probably going to be sufficient for you. Okay. So if you don't wear glasses, you'll need something. If you wear prescription glasses, that typically we let, we let our people use those prescription glasses as their shooting, their shooting eyes, their protection. Unless you had something, uh, some real, something small that just didn't even really cover the, the eyeballs, you're going to need to put something over that. Okay, and you can wear prescriptions and then put some clear glasses over them. Whatever you got to do, protect those eyes. You only got two of them. Uh, ear protection, those can be earmuffs. That's not the winter kind, but the, the ones that knock out the sound. Uh, ear plugs, whatever you want to use. If you're shooting something heavy, some, some large caliber rifles and things like that, or even the big 500 Smith & Wesson pistol, um, and doing a lot of shooting, you may consider putting in plugs and earmuffs over them as well. The plugs are great, but the only thing about the plugs, earplugs, when you put them for shooting, when you put them in, 
it sounds like you're getting a lot of protection because it muffles the gunshot, but there's a lot of sound that comes through the outsides of your ears, through the back of your ears and everything. So all you're really doing is plugging the hole. We'd like to be able to cover the whole ear itself with some good hearing protection. Uh, never consume drugs and or alcohol when carrying or handling your firearm. Okay. All right, so ammunition. Try to get, does anybody need a break yet? All right, so we'll get through this. We'll get through this part and then we'll take a quick break. All right, so we're going to talk about ammunition before we get into the, the workings of the gun. When at all possible, try to shoot only factory loaded ammunition. Shooting anything otherwise could be dangerous unless it comes from someone skilled at reloading ammunition. So basically, there's ammunition manufacturers out there, people that make ammunition on an assembly line, and it's got checks and balances and checked and checked and double checked, and that's uh, typically the stuff that's safe to shoot, okay, with, with no questions. There can be uh, ammo malfunctions sometime, but it's typically from the factory, it's not the kind of malfunction that's gonna blow the gun up, okay? Simply the piece of ammunition just won't work for whatever reason. Um, then there are people, individuals, that do what's called reloading ammunition. So they collect empty brass from shooting guns, and then they'll take that and they take the empty brass, they'll take a bullet, they'll take gunpowder, all the components, a primer, and they'll build their own piece of ammunition. That's called reloading. And it, it's almost a science. I mean, you got, we got some guys in here that do that stuff, and it's very technical. It's got to be uh, super, super precise because when you're talking about measuring out gunpowder and putting in the correct amount, it can be the difference of the bullet flying like it's supposed to or it being overpressured and blowing the gun up. So if you, got, if you get some ammo from Uncle Bob, say, I got some ammo I'm going to give you, you better know what Uncle Bob's capabilities are because maybe he doesn't know how to reload ammunition. And maybe he did it in the garage while he was drinking, and uh, it may not be good stuff to shoot. So try to shoot only factory-loaded stuff if you can, stuff you can go buy off the shelf. Uh, this is an example of that, uh, overpressure ammunition. Uh, the backstory on this, this guy is actually was loading some ammunition. He, he loaded up some stuff and he loaded it too hot, which means it had too much powder in it. It's too, too hot, too powerful for this gun. And when he went to the range and fired it, it blew the top part of that gun off. It blew the top strap off and that piece came up and hit him in the head. And he walked away from it. He didn't die, but he could have. I mean, it could have been very serious. But that's the amount of pressure that this ammunition builds up inside that gun chamber when the, when the round is fired. I mean, it's got some significant pressure behind it. Remember, it can launch these bullets for miles. So it's got to have some, some force behind it. Here's another picture that blew the top half of the cylinder off, blew the top strap off the frame. And uh, luckily, he walked away from it. I saw a video the, just the other day where a guy was shooting a 50 caliber rifle. Do you know what that is? It's a rifle and it shoots a 50 caliber bullet. It's like a big sniper gun, basically. And the guy was shooting some old, uh, just some old uh, kind of off the wall ammo that he had found, was shooting it. And the powder, the amount of powder in each round was so inconsistent that some of the bullets were hitting the dirt, some of them were going this way or this way, and it wasn't his shooting because he's a great shooter. So it was a difference in the way the ammo was loaded. So he keeps shooting and shooting. He gets to the point, he says, well, I'm gonna shoot one more. And he loads it up and he shoots the gun. This round is loaded incorrect. It's been loaded by the person making the ammo incorrectly, and it blew the gun apart. And this, this is a, a sniper rifle that's meant to shoot for miles and miles, so it had, there's a lot of pressure behind this, behind this bullet, trying to fire this bullet. Blew the gun apart. He had a piece of the gun come off, hit him in the eye. He was wearing glasses. He was wearing shooting glasses, protection. He hit the glasses. The glasses blocked it. It came down. It broke his orbital all around here. He had a piece... Uh, another piece come off the gun 
went through his neck and cut his jugular. He had another piece that went in somewhere in here and ricocheted and came down and uh, cut through his lung. And he was there shooting with his, with his dad. He's an ex-military guy. He was there shooting with his dad. And uh, they got him loaded up in the car real quick. And, uh, you know, his dad said, hey, stick your finger in this hole, you know, to stop the blood. And went to the hospital and everything. Long story short, he lived. But, man, this dude almost died from that. You know what I mean? So that's the severity of this kind of thing. So try to shoot that factory loaded ammo. Always match the caliber and type of ammunition to the gun. Most guns and ammunition will be marked accordingly. This will ensure the correct ammo is being loaded into the gun. So here's some example of some different cartridges. Uh, starting from the left, 22, 32, 380, 9 millimeter, 40, 45, 38, 357, and 44. Those are just some different examples. Some of those are meant to shoot in semi-automatics. Some of them are meant to shoot in revolvers. Some of them can even cross over between the two. But when we're trying to identify what, what ammo do I need to shoot in my gun, this is what we need to look for. The caliber designation is stamped on the head of the cartridge. That's up there on number one. The head of the cartridge is, is where the head stamp is, but it's actually... And this is, this is called a dummy round, by the way. We didn't name it that, but that's what it's called. It's a dummy round. It's inert, which means it can't fire. It's just for training purposes. So the head stamp is actually at the base of the cartridge, the bottom of it. And if you turn that over and look at it, it's going to have some information on there as to who made it, what caliber, and that kind of thing. So look at the head stamp on the cartridge. This is federal ammo. And what, what's it going to shoot in? What, what gun is that? What caliber? 45, 45 auto. Number two, it's marked on the weapon. You can see on number two there, it's marked 45 auto. Now this particular gun, it's got it marked on the barrel itself, the top of the barrel where that barrel hood is. It's marked right there. A lot of guns, it will also be marked on the slide. be marked on the side of the slide, maybe on the frame. On a long gun, like a rifle or shotgun, it should be marked on the barrel itself, probably close to where the trigger group is, back towards the, the workings of the gun. Uh, but it's going to be marked on there somewhere. Unless you've got some old, obscure weapon, or maybe something that's been filed off or something like that, then it should say on that gun somewhere what ammo it shoots. Uh, so right now we got 45 ammo, we got 45 uh, handgun, and then number three, it's going to be printed on the factory box. You can see on there it says 45 auto on that box. The, I don't know if you can read that, that second number, 230 grain, that's given the weight of the bullet, the weight of the bullet itself, and then the HST is the, the style of the bullet. This is a hollow point, so that's a, a hydroshock tactical. Irrelevant, but it's going to say it in those places. It's going to say it on the, the head stamp of the cartridge. It'll say it on the gun, and then it'll have it printed on the box. We need to match those up to make sure we're shooting the right stuff. Some, and, and, and this could get real lengthy, but I'm going to keep it simple for you. Uh, some ammunition may have multiple designations for the same cartridge, such as, and it'll, it'll read like this on the ammo itself and maybe on the gun itself. So for your basic 9mm round, you may see something like this. 9mm Para, 9mm Luger, 9x19mm, and then some other ones on top of that. But it's all the same round and it'll work in all those listings that it has, whether it says that on the gun or whatever kind of ammo you're shooting. If it says that, it's a basic 9mm. Another example is like we just saw, 45 Auto is the same thing as 45 ACP. All right. So, you know, there, there could be different designations. You just got to kind of know. If you don't know, you'll learn it. But here's the thing. When in doubt, research it or ask somebody. You know, um, if you're at a gun store or something like that, they should be able to lead you in the right direction on what ammo you need to buy to fit the gun 
you could you could look it up online. There's plenty of resources out there where you can find out if you're shooting the right stuff. So this is what uh, this is what ammo looks like if we were to cut it open. So on the left we have these are nine millimeter rounds. By the way, it doesn't matter, but just it's nine millimeter. The one on the left is considered a full metal jacket. Now what that's talking about, FMJ, full metal jacket, it's talking about what type of bullet is that. When the gun is fired and it sends that bullet to the target, that bullet is a full metal jacket. It's a, in this case it'd be a chunk of lead, but it is jacketed with copper. So it's a full metal jacket. Uh, the one on the right is, everybody's heard of a hollow point probably. This is a jacketed hollow point, which means uh, I, similar bullet design, but this one has a cavity cut out of the middle of it. And then of course it has a jacket around the round as well. That's a jacketed hollow point. The one on the left we use typically for practice or training, um, just general target shooting. The one on the right would be considered a defensive round. Okay. Now understand this both of these could kill you just the same, okay? Either one of them is going to do the job. The one on the right is meant to do a little more damage because it's a defensive round, okay? The reason it has that cavity hollowed out in the middle of that bullet is so, as a defensive round, when it hits a, a person, it hits body tissue, that cavity fills up and then it spreads out that bullet. It mushrooms that bullet so it increases in size almost by double. So it would do more damage. That'd be for a defensive round. A lot of people say, well, man, that's inhumane. You know, it's doing more damage, that's inhumane. But think about it like this. If that bullet's more effective for self-defense, then maybe I only have to shoot you once, where with the other one, maybe I gotta shoot you three or four times to get the same effect. Does that make sense? So, you know, you start to judge what, what is inhumane on that. But the makeup of this piece of ammunition up top, you have the bullet itself. And you can see how long that bullet actually is. It seats down into that casing. So you have the bullet. Next, you have the casing itself. Then you have the powder. That's the gunpowder. And then on the bottom, you have the primer. That's what it looks like if we cut one open. So the way this works is when we load this up and put it in the gun, get it ready to shoot, around is and a round is just a single piece of ammunition. We, we can refer to it as ammunition, ammo, a round, a cartridge, and that's it. That's typically how, what we call them. Different, different names, but it's the same thing. Some people call them bullets. Hey, give me some bullets. Well, I know what you mean when you say that, but the bullet actually is just a piece of that ammunition. That's the part that comes out and, and goes down range. But nonetheless, this is what happens. The round gets chambered into the gun. The firing pin strikes the primer on the back of the round. The primer flash, the primer has a, has a it makes a small spark, it makes a little flash. The primer flash ignites the gunpowder and the burning gunpowder creates gas pressure and forces the bullet out of the barrel. So all that pressure I was talking about, I'll show you the gun that was blown up and stuff, that's, that's what's happening when that round is fired. You have a a small flash which ignites the gunpowder, which creates an explosion, which builds up gas pressure. The only place it has to go is the path of least resistance, and that's to push the bullet out of the casing and down the barrel, and then the bullet goes flying wherever it goes. Hopefully it hits the target. So that's how a piece of ammunition works on one of these cartridges. And this is the end result. This is what it looks like. This is an actual photo. There's no Photoshop on this. But uh, this is a slow-mo picture. So you can see the gun is fired. You can still see the, the explosion, the muzzle flash happening inside the barrel there. Uh, the bullet's coming out. It's going down range. All that debris that's coming out, all that powder burning stuff that's coming out. It's pretty cool, pretty cool picture. So this is what the inside of our barrel looks like. Uh, unless you're shooting something old like a musket or maybe some shotguns. Uh, just about every barrel, especially on most handguns, are gonna have what's called rifling. So on the left, we're looking through the barrel. We're looking through the end where the round would sit in the chamber. We're looking through that barrel and you see those grooves that 
that spiral. That's called rifling. Those are grooves that are made into that, the inside of that barrel. The inside of the barrel is called the bore, but it has those grooves in there. And what those grooves do is when the bullet is fired, it makes the bullet spin like this. And when it comes out, the bullet is still spinning. It's just like when we, uh, when we throw a pass with a football, if we throw a good spiral, then it's gonna be real accurate. If we, if we don't throw a good spiral, there's no telling where it's going. It's going to be like a knuckleball. So the bullet rotating like that, the bullet spinning is what helps it fly true. Does that make sense? So on the right is a fired bullet that's been retained. We've, we've got it back and looked at it. And you can see the rifling marks on this bullet. You can see where the bullet has been forced down the barrel and it has left those impressions on that round. So the bullet fits tight in there. If you, took a, if you took that barrel and held it long ways up and down and you took that bullet and dropped it in the barrel, it's gonna get stuck. It's not gonna just fall through. That's how tight it fits in there. You'd be hard pressed to push it through there with a hammer and a rod. So that's how, again, that's how much pressure it's taken to send that bullet down the, down the barrel. Okay. All right, so that's it on ammo. Does anybody have any questions on the ammo part? All right, so we're going to take a we're going to take a quick break. All right, so now we talked about ammo. Now we're going to get into uh, the basic handguns. We're going to break it down. There's a lot of different stuff. We're going to break it down and keep it simple on uh, two basic types of handguns, and that is a semi-automatic. You may hear it referred to as semi-auto. Uh, it's the same thing, and a revolver, semi-automatic and revolver. So handgun nomenclature on semi-automatic. Nomenclature is just the parts and pieces of the gun. Now this is just a basic diagram listing the parts, basically the external parts of the gun. Now there's a lot more involved in this if we broke it down and took it apart, uh, how it would be built in the factory. There's uh, a lot of different springs and pins and all kind of stuff that make this thing work, but this is just the external parts, the things that the shooter would really need to know about to operate the gun. So number one, you can see we have two number ones up there on the top of the gun. Those are the sights. <clears throat> More specifically, there's a front sight and a rear sight. And they're not just for decoration, we actually use the sights to be able to shoot the gun, shoot the gun accurately. So if I'm shooting this gun, I'm lining up the front sight and the rear sight, and that's my aiming technique, is I use the front and the rear, put them together, and that's how I'll aim the gun. So they're there for a purpose. Number two, we have the muzzle. Everybody knows what the muzzle is, right? <clears throat> Number three is the slide. The slide is actually the top half of the gun. This is the moving part. When the gun fires, and I'm gonna show you a little animation on this in a minute, but on the slide, it's, it's a moving part. When I fire the gun, the slide will cycle back and forth. Every time I press the trigger, it'll cycle, it'll cycle, it'll cycle, it'll keep moving. And I'm gonna show you a little video on that. Uh, number four, we have the slide stop. The slide stop is it's the little control that I can use to lock the slide to the rear to keep it open. It's also the same piece that I can use to release the slide to close it. All right, so that, that piece does two functions. It can lock the slide open and it can release the slide. Now, just so you know, some gun manufacturers will call these parts different names but they're all similar in what they do, okay? Uh, for instance, Glock, this is a Glock handgun. Glock calls that number four a slide stop. Uh, a SIG, they wanna call it the slide catch, slide catch lever technically, and then on and on some other, other things, but it all, it's the same part that does the same function. It either, it either locks the slide open or it closes the slide. Uh, number five, magazine catch. That's the button that is going to release this magazine from the gun. And by the way, this is a magazine. 
A lot of people refer to it as a clip, but it, <laughs> he's going, no, it's a magazine. If you're one of our recruits and you call it a clip, you owe us some push-ups. <laughs> but if you call it a clip, I know what you mean, okay? But just if you wanna be technical, this is a magazine, okay? It houses all the ammo that we're gonna put into the gun. So it goes in, actually, let me do it like this. Let me see if it'll, okay. Y'all listen to this click. Y'all hear that? That's the magazine locking into the gun. And the reason it locked in is because of this part number five, that magazine catch. It's spring loaded. And when the magazine comes up and goes as far as it'll go, it bumps out that little uh, magazine catch and then it locks in, holds the magazine in place. Okay, that's what that click is. So if I wanted to dump this magazine or get this magazine out of the gun, I press that, yes. Most of them do. That's a good question. Most of them have that, and, I, and I'll explain that in just a second. Most of them have this. She's asking if all these semi-auto pistols have this number five part on there. And the answer is almost, okay? On some guns, it'll look different. So you can see what it looks like on a Glock. It's a square button. On this one, it's just about in the same place, but this one's round. It's just, it looks kind of like a little mini sweet tart or something. It's just a, a little bitty round button, but it does the same function. Other guns, they look different depending on the make or model. And it's gonna be about in the same place where the shooter could access it with their thumb, okay? Some of them, some guns, again, depending on the make and model, and I think, Greg, is it Walther that has one on the, built into the trigger guard, bottom of the trigger guard? Uh, some of them, it's down here on this piece, and it's, it's built into that, and it's, you press it down instead of pressing it in, so on and so forth. Now, here's the other thing. On some guns, depending on what you have, you could have what's called a European style magazine release. It'll be back here. It'll be a lever that you have to press down and let that magazine come out, depending on what kind of gun you have. But most guns in operation today, everyday stuff that we would have, is gonna have one of those located in that spot. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? Now here's the other thing, most of them, or a lot of them, are made for what we would consider a right-handed shooter because they'll be on this side where I can operate it with my thumb. Some guns, depending on the make and model, you can swap that to the other side to where a left-handed shooter could utilize their thumb for that. If I had this gun and it could only be on this side and I was a left-handed shooter, I'm gonna use my finger to drop the mag. But uh, some guns have it, what's called ambidextrous, which means it has a button on both sides. You could use either, either hand or either thumb. Does that answer your question on that? Okay, good question. All right, so the magazine catch, that's gonna lock the magazine into the gun. It's also gonna let us pop that magazine out. Uh, number six is the trigger. Number seven is the trigger guard. Why do we call it the trigger guard? What's that? That's right. It's guarding the trigger. It's kind of like a face mask on a football helmet. You know, that's, that's protecting that trigger. Uh, uh, we want that to be intact. Don't cut that trigger guard off or anything because it's, it needs to be there. Uh, number eight is the frame. So the frame itself is basically what would be in red up here. That's the lower half of this gun. So we had the top half, which was the slide, and it houses the barrel and the firing assembly. The bottom half would be the frame, kind of the backbone of the gun, and it holds the firing mechanism as far as the trigger group. And if I was taking this apart, you'll see some pictures here in a minute. If I was taking this apart, I would end up taking the top half off of the bottom half and I would have two different halves and then I could break down the slide assembly even further than that. And I'm gonna show you a picture of that for a, a basic field stripping. Uh, number nine is the grip. Number 10 is the magazine well. So what that's pointing at is the magazine well is 
the opening inside the grip where the magazine goes. All right, that's the magazine well. And then number 10 is the, I mean, number 11 is the magazine. All right, like I said, there's more, more into it than that if we took it apart, but that's, that's the basic nomenclature on how the gun operates. So if you were to break this down to clean it, this is as far as you would need to go. You would take it apart and you'd have the four main parts to the gun. Uh, up top you have the slide. Next you have the barrel. Then you have the recoil spring assembly. And then you have the frame. So on that recoil spring assembly, it's up here in this part of the gun. And right now, because I have the slide locked to the rear, that spring is smashed down. That spring's compressed. It's got pressure behind it. It's ready to go. So when I press down on this release to release the slide, the spring is going to throw that slide to the front. So that's what that spring does. That's the recoil spring assembly. Every time I shoot the gun and it fires, it cycles and it's compressing the spring. The spring takes it back to the front, compresses it, takes it back to the front. So that spring is super important. But that's the four main parts of the gun. That's as far as we'd want to go to to break it down and clean it. That's as far as we let our officers and our recruits break it down to clean it. Anything further than that, it's gonna be done by an instructor. So some of you may uh, be a armor or self-made armor where you can take it down further than that, but I wouldn't suggest it unless you know what you're doing. All right, so cycle of operation. Let me go back here, I'm gonna, show you, I'm gonna put on a little video to show you how the semi-auto operates. All right, so there's no sound to this, but I'm gonna kind of talk you through what's going on. So this is also on a Glock, just by chance. Uh, I acquired this about, about 12 years ago from somebody. It was legal and everything. But uh, we didn't carry Glocks at the time, but it still represents how semi-automatic works. So, and as, as would have it, we, we have Glocks today. But so basically what's going on is when the slide comes forward, it strips off the top round from the magazine, feeds it in the chamber. The gun locks into position. It's showing you how the mag comes out here. That's not a part of the firing sequence, but watch the trigger. The firing pin up top is gonna come forward and hit the primer, cause the explosion, it fires the bullet. The slide will come to the rear and cycle. It extracts the empty brass. It ejects it from the gun. It's going to strip off a new one, it's going to feed it, it's going to chamber it, it locks into position. Now we're going to do a, a mag change. Again, it's just demonstrating how the mag works. And then we're going to get ready to fire. The gun cycles, the brass comes back. And that's how it works. I mean, kind of in a nutshell, the meat and potatoes of it, that's how a semi-auto works. Um, pretty simple, as long as there's ammo in that gun and it, it doesn't come into some kind of malfunction, then just keep pulling the trigger and it'll keep shooting and shooting and shooting until you run out of ammo, All right? Does that make sense to everybody? Is that, any, any questions on that? Awesome. So loading a handgun, this is going to be for a semi-automatic, and what I've done is I couldn't, put, I couldn't put any videos in this because of the way I had to set it up, but I've got some still pictures and I'm going to talk, kind of talk you through it on the process and then I'll show it to you live with dummy rounds and um, you maybe get a better understanding of it. But this, this is basically just a simple loading process on a semi-automatic handgun. Uh, first, this is, let's talk about what's going in the gun. So this is what a magazine looks like for a semi-auto. On the left is traditionally what you see. It's a, uh, typically it's black, it could be whatever color, but typically they're black and you can't really see into them. You just fill them up with ammo until you got as many in there as you need or want. 
and the magazine's ready to go. So what you see in the middle, the two in the middle, those are actual real magazines. They're just made out of clear plastic. And I actually have some of these for demo purposes, but they do work. They're, they're good magazines and they, they really fire in the gun and everything. But I got them for demo because you can see what's going on inside the magazine. So the second picture there, where it's an empty magazine, you can see that magazine spring that runs all the way up to the top. On the right of that, when we put 15 rounds in there, which is what this one holds, you see how it crams that spring all the way down to the bottom? And you see how up towards the top of that magazine, those rounds, they look kind of like a hot mess, right? But it actually, the design on this, it actually feeds those rounds really good because when the top one comes up, that's the only one that comes out, it feeds into the chamber just like we saw, it fires, extracts, the slide comes back, it strips off the next round off the top and it keeps feeding them, keeps feeding them, keeps feeding them. And then on the right, what I'm showing you is we're looking at the back of a magazine now on the right. Um, the one right here is what we're seeing here. And this is called a double stack, a double stack magazine. Now, there are guns, as a matter of fact, I got a good example right here. There are guns that are considered double stack, which means it has a wider grip, which will take a wider magazine and the rounds will be double stacked all the way up to the top. And then there's guns that are on the far right, single stack, where it has a narrower grip and narrower magazine well, and it takes a thinner magazine. Everybody see the difference on these two thicknesses, the opening on that mag well? This one's wider, this one's skinnier. And those are the respective magazines that these guns would take. So looking at that picture, what's the difference in those two? Amount. Amount of ammunition we can get, right? So some people prefer a thinner grip on the gun, fits their hand better. So they would go with something that's a single stack, a little thinner. Some people like something a little thicker. Maybe it's because they want more ammo, whatever the case. Different guns have different setups. There's the difference between double stack and single stack. When it feeds up, when the first one comes out, when that first one comes out, that next one's going to come from the left, and then and then back to the right. It, it'll alternate. Yes, yes, yeah. It'll it'll do like this. Let me put this on you. Take this one and this one here, 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 here. They'll keep coming up like that. Good question. All right, so that's the deal about the magazine. So here we go. To load this gun and on this, on this picture, and I'm gonna show you something different when we get through this, but on this picture, I'm loading this from with the slide locked open already, okay? So with the muzzle pointed in a safe direction, which for me in this picture, is like this. This is what I'm looking like in that picture. I'm going to insert the magazine into the gun. And you'll notice, see that orange tip on that dummy round is facing toward the front. That's the way, it, that's the way that this magazine would go in the gun. We would put the round into the magazine with the front of the round facing the front of the magazine. And then that goes in the gun like this because this is the front of the gun. This could try to go in here. It's not going to fit backwards. So it's only going to go one way on that. Okay. So we insert the magazine into the gun and we go all the way up until it's fully seated. So this is what that would look like. Once this, and think about this, when this thing's filled up with ammo, it's going to have some weight to it. It's going to be heavy. So some people, when they put this mag in, they want to do this. They want to start it and then take their hand off and jam it in. This is what could happen. All right. It could fall out super fast, especially if it's got some weight to it. So what I want to do is I'm going to ride it all the way up with the palm of my hand till it gets fully seated. Does that make sense? All right. So now we're at that point. We got the magazine fully seated. 
Next, we're going to use a thumb to press down on the slide release. So what I'm using, I've got an arrow drawn to what it is up there. Remember, that's that little control that lets us close the slide. What you got? The magazine? And it doesn't, it gets stuck and jammed? Uh, that could be a concern. Do you have that problem going on? Does the magazine, is the magazine made for that gun? Do you know? I think so. I got it from a uh, gun show. From a gun show? What kind of gun is it? Do you know? All right. So... Almost always, magazines are, sp are specific for a certain make and model of gun. Um, need to make sure that the magazine, and, and some magazines will be labeled or even have the name of the gun on it, like Beretta, Beretta, Beretta on the mag, Beretta on the gun, Glock on the mag, Glock on the gun. So we need to make sure that the magazine is for that gun. We need to make sure that that magazine is the correct caliber for that gun because if it's not in all cases, but in, in certain guns, if I was trying to put a bigger caliber magazine into a smaller caliber gun, it may not fit. Um, there could be some other issues in there as well. Are, when you're doing that, are, is there ammo in the magazine? You're just doing it empty? Sometimes they kind of hang up and you, and you have to could be damaged, it could be damaged, it could be bent or something. Is it, uh, do you know if it, is it a metal magazine or is it plastic like it's this metal. one? It's metal. Could be bent. Um, How many magazines did it come with? Did it just come with one? Uh, it came with two. Did they both do the same thing? <clears throat> so you're talking about what we're Putting it into the mag well, is it not fitting at all? Is it sliding into the mag well? Or not? It'll go in, but it'll kind of, I have to put pressure in it. Okay. Yeah. So it will go in? Yeah. Okay. All right. So uh, let me see if I can use it. Let's see if this one will do it. No, no, no. You may, somebody else may be. All right, so check this out. So, empty gun, empty magazine. So on this particular gun, watch this. Hey, let me back up so everybody can see this. There's there's a lot of resistance right there, and that is that where that's where it happened. Okay, that is the beginning of the magazine starting to come in contact with the magazine catch which is trying to lock it into the gun. And what that's doing is the magazine catch is pressed in a little bit. This is coming up and it's trying to force its way in there and press that magazine catch out. So this can get in and all the way up into a notch right here and get it locked in the gun. So when I bring it in, I feel that resistance, but it just goes right in. I have to push past that. Does that make sense? That very, if I knew what kind of gun it was, we may know better, but that is most likely what it could be. If you have any concerns on that, um, if you know somebody that knows anything about guns, or you may take it to a gun store and let them look at it and make sure everything's fitting like it should. Have you ever fired a gun before? Uh, yeah. That particular gun with those magazines? Yeah. Did everything work? Yes. You're good to go. All right. I think it's a case of this right here, whatever gun it is, it's just hitting resistance when it gets to that beginning of hitting the mag catch you just get it locked in if it locks in if it shoots the gun with no malfunctions and no problem you're good to go okay a very good question though all right so we're fixing guns and everything in here all right all right so back on this once we get that magazine seated y'all know the control that we're going to press to close the slide and Depending on your technique, depending on your hand size, whatever the case, and I put it up here like this, use a thumb to close the slide. Is anybody a left-handed shooter? Or do you know if you're a left-handed pistol shooter in here? If you were, 
and you were using this particular gun, which is set up with that release on this side, I would use my trigger finger to close that. But since everybody's right-handed, we're gonna use the thumb. So the reason I put use a thumb is because I can use my gun thumb to close that slide, or once I get the mag in place, I can use my support thumb. So this is my dominant hand, this is my support hand. I can use my support thumb. I prefer to use, for me, my support thumb. Doesn't matter which thumb you use, use one of those bad boys to close the slide. If the slide is hard to press down, you may have to get a thumb on a thumb to close it down. Does that make sense? The most important thing is what? The trigger finger is always posted on that frame, never drifting down inside that trigger guard or touching the trigger. Because we're working on the gun, we're not shooting the gun yet, right? So, insert the mag fully seated, close the slide. The gun is now loaded. That's it. Easy steps. Does that make sense? All right, so I told you I was going to show you something different on that. So that one, that one I loaded from a slide locked open position. This gun could also be loaded from a slide closed position. And so the way I would do that, the first couple steps are just the same. Insert the mag until it's fully seated. Now what I'll have to do, since I can't close the slide and chamber around, how am I gonna get one in the chamber this time? I gotta do this, right? All right, so the technical word for this is rack. I'm gonna rack the slide. And the way that happens is like this. I present that gun out in front of me. I rotate it inboard. I'm gonna grasp the slide just like this. And then smartly, that means with purpose, I rack the gun. I have fully cycled the slide and let it strip off around and feed it into the chamber. Now it's loaded. You can see the orange tip in there. This is cut away so you can see that. So now there's one in the chamber. I've racked it, made the gun hot, charged it, loaded it. All those words mean the same thing. Okay, does that make sense? So it can be loaded from the slide open, mag in, drop the slide, it's chambered. If the slide's closed, mag in, rack it, now it's loaded. All right, everybody good on that? Let me cover something real quick. While I'm talking about... While I'm talking about racking the slide, and so on, we're gonna to get to a little bit more on that in a minute. But while I'm talking about racking the slide, the way we teach, the Shelby County Sheriff's Office, the way we teach it is when you rack the slide, you bring the gun out in front of you, you'll rack it, however many times you need to, this is just for demo. Rack it with purpose, rack it like you're mad at it, okay, because if you do what's called riding the slide, and a lot of people do this, they pull back and then ease it forward, that can cause a malfunction. The way this gun is supposed to operate is the full power of that spring is supposed to slam that slide to the front to feed that magazine. I mean, it needs to jam that, uh, to feed that round. It needs to jam that round into the chamber. And if we ride the slide, in other words, if we ease it forward, it may cause a malfunction. It may tip that round up and get it stuck. So we need to let some force feed that round into the chamber. Does that make sense? So rack it hard, rack it like you're mad at it. Um, same thing when we lock the slide open, we go to the same position out in front of us and we, uh, we lock the slide open. There, and we do everything out in front of us like that. There are, put some sanitizer on my hands. There are some schools and some people that teach to do it like this. If I'm facing this way, they teach to, instead of doing it underhand like we do it in front of us, they teach to go overhand like this and bring it into the side to lock it open or rack the slide. And there's nothing wrong with that technique except for one thing. And that is that it puts the gun facing off our center line of our body. So if he's on line with me, if we're on the, shoot, if we're on the firing line together, 
remember this is a training gun, there's no issue with this. If we're on the firing line together and I need to rack my gun, what am I doing with this? <laughs> right? He don't think that's funny. I'll be very angry. If I'm trying to lock the slide open, and it's, it's mechanically for my body, it's easier to do this because I'm stronger like this. But is it dangerous? Absolutely. Okay. So be mindful of that. Remember, we're always going to keep that muzzle pointed in a safe direction. And that covers both of those instances. If you have to, depending on your strength level and all that kind of stuff, if you have to come over the top to work the slide or lock the slide open, and this is the direction I'm supposed to be facing, I don't even have to move my feet. All I have to do is turn my body so I can keep, this is the same body position, but the gun is in a safe direction. Does that make sense? And I can do all this work on the gun while it's pointing downrange in a safe direction. Does that make sense? You gotta be 100% dialed in on that. That has to be ingrained up here. Whatever I'm doing, if, I about, if I'm about to fall with this gun, I'm gonna control where it's pointing. You know what I mean? You really gotta be thinking like that. So, let's talk about, we got it loaded now. Let's talk about if we wanted to unload it. Unloading it is really just kind of the reverse order. We're going to, first thing we want to do on a semi-auto is we want to remove the source of ammo. So the source of ammo in this case is the magazine. Press in on the magazine release to remove the magazine. And I'll take that mag out. Press in on the magazine release and remove the magazine. I'll take it, maybe I'll stick it in my pocket. If I'm at a shooting bench, I'll put it on the bench, whatever the case, it doesn't matter. I'm gonna secure it somewhere so I got a free hand. So now I've, re I've removed the source of ammo. Uh, what's next, do you think? Okay, y'all are smart. And let me, let me say this, in all serious, if you don't take anything else away from this class, take this away from this class. At this point right here, is where most accidents are going to happen okay and i mean that with all my heart a lot of people have the misunderstanding or misconception that if i remove the magazine the gun is safe and empty if there's something in the chamber the gun can still fire and i got a little slide to remind you of that but the gun is not safe and empty until i clear that chamber and make sure the entire gun is safe and empty does that make sense anybody have any question on that all right, so I've removed the source of ammo. Here it is, caution. Some guns, this is one of them, if it was a real gun, but this model, some guns are capable of firing even with the magazine removed, okay? Um, some guns are designed, if the magazine is taken out of the gun, the trigger won't work, it's a dead trigger. It's called a magazine disconnect safety. It's, it's built like that. So it would re render the gun inoperable until the magazine's put back in the gun, okay? Some departments have that for a purpose. Some, some have others that'll fire with the magazine out. But just remember, it's not safe and empty until we clear that chamber. So we're gonna rack the slide to clear the round from the chamber. So we know how to rack it, the way we would do that. I rack the slide. I have cleared the round from my chamber, but it's, I'm, I'm not done yet. I got another very important part. I have to lock the slide to the rear and safety check the weapon. So this is what we're doing when we safety check it. We're looking, let me get my pointer on this. We're looking at the chamber area where the round would be sitting and the magazine well. That's how we're gonna verify that it's safe and empty. And I would do that, physically I would do that like this. I would look at the chamber and the mag well. And the way we do it, the sheriff mentioned it earlier, it's something called CIT. That's what we use, it's something called CIT. It stands for check it twice. And this is what that would look like. Chamber, mag well, that's once. Chamber, mag well, that's twice. I've checked it twice, I've CIT'd it, now I know that it's safe and empty. Okay, so that's our process 
yours should be something similar. But this is what I'm looking to see, an empty chamber and an empty mag well. This should not be considered safe and empty. I still got something in the chamber. Now, most likely it's going to be empty brass that's left in there, but it could be a live round. Who cares what it is? It's something in the chamber that's not supposed to be there, so let's get it out. All right. This is still left in the chamber. And what we got going on over here? You got a magazine with rounds in it. Okay, so that's definitely a no-go on that. So that is not safe and empty. This is what we want to see on the left. Empty chamber. That's a no-go on that. A chamber's not empty yet. So if I had my slide open and saw that on the right, then what I would do to get that out is I would continue to work that slide until it picked it up and pulled it out of the chamber, all right? If it didn't pick it up and pull it out of the chamber for some reason, then something is either mechanically wrong with the gun or the brass or the round or whatever is wedged into the chamber of some kind. Either way, you've got some kind of, I'd say, near catastrophic failure with the gun and we need to leave it locked open and then safely get it somewhere where somebody or you, if you know what you're doing, can work on it and get that out of the out of the chamber. Does that make sense? What you got? Oh, stand by. All right, so we're recognizing the difference in a safe chamber and not. Same thing on the magazine well. On the left, it's completely empty. That's safe. Uh, the one in the middle, it's got a magazine in it still with live ammo. What about the one on the right? It's got an empty mag in there. Is that still no go on that, even though the mag's empty? What do y'all think? Who, somebody said it over here. It's not empty, right? So that's, that's still a no-go. Even if it's an empty magazine, we want to see a completely empty gun, completely empty chamber, completely empty magwell. All right, handgun nomenclature on a revolver. Any, anybody got a revolver in here? Revolver shooters? Okay. Real simple on this, same, kind of similar to uh, the uh, semi-auto. Up top, we got number one, the sights. Number two, the muzzle. Number three is the barrel. Number four is the frame. Number five is the cylinder. Number six is the trigger guard. Number seven is the trigger. Number eight is the hammer. Number nine is the cylinder release. Number 10 is the grip. And number 11, extractor rod. And again, there's more parts and pieces on the inside of this thing. Um, and again, certain manufacturers call certain parts a certain name. In this case, Smith & Wesson, they refer to number nine as the thumb piece. But we use cylinder release because any, not any, but most revolvers you pick up will have some type of release that unlocks the cylinder if you have that kind of revolver. There are some revolvers that... don't have a swing out cylinder the still cylinder stays in line and you have to load and unload through by way of a, what's called a loading gate on the side one round at a time um, we're not we're not getting into all the different types of revolvers or different types of semi-autos we're just keeping it basic with the most common but these are the parts and pieces the nomenclature on that Uh, I got a little video on this. I'm not sure how the volume is going to be, so let me get back here. Can you check that, Don, when I get it going? This came from the handgun permit class.
itself in a particular position so it's perfectly lined up with the barrel. When the trigger lever is pushed all the way back, it releases the hammer. The compressed spring drives the hammer forward. The firing pin on the hammer extends through the body of the gun and hits the primer. The primer explodes, igniting the propellant. The propellant burns, releasing a large volume of gas. And the gas pressure drives the bullet down the barrel. The gas pressure also causes the cartridge case to expand, temporarily sealing the breach. All the expanding gas pushes forward rather than backward. All right, pretty basic, kind of a generic video, but kind of give you an understanding of how a revolver works. Uh, real quick, cool thing about a revolver is, and don't, don't misunderstand this, the use of all guns need training, okay? The use of a revolver can require less training than the use of a semi-auto. Revolver's got, it's got a different functionality to it, it's got different, different parts, and it doesn't work as sophisticated as a semi-auto. All right, so uh, a lot of people ask, you know, what's better, a revolver or a semi-auto? Well, you know, either one is your choice, but a revolver, there's not many malfunctions that you would need to know how to fix on it. It can malfunction, but there's not many that you would need to know how to fix to operate it as opposed to a semi-auto, okay? Uh, they're just a little simpler. The trade-off is, um, the difference in ammo, lack of ammo, 17 rounds versus five or six or whatever the case. Uh, so just a consideration on that. All right, so loading, I'll tell you what, let me pause right here. Uh, loading process for the revolver. We're gonna press the cylinder release. I got a arrow drawn to it up there. Now, depending on the maker model, this one in the picture up here is a Smith & Wesson. So this cylinder release is gonna press forward. If it was a Colt, you would pull it to the rear and other, other brands, but just some examples. If it was a Ruger, you would press it in. Whatever the case, whatever model or make it is, there should be some type of, that's why we just call it cylinder release. There should be some button or lever right here that lets you unlock the cylinder to open it up. So we push the cylinder release and then push open the cylinder from the opposite side. We swing it out to the side it opens to. Insert the rounds into the cylinder. Now you can do these one at a time like I'm doing in the photo, or you could use, there's a couple different devices, but you could use something called a speed loader, which looks like this. It's just a little piece that contains the set number of rounds that are gonna go into that particular gun. Now they are gun and, well, they're gun and size specific. Um, I'll just point out to you just, I just noticed it myself the other day, but the picture on the right is a six shot and this speed loader that I got here as an example is a seven shot. So they make different size uh, round counts on revolvers. The most common are probably five or six, but they make sevens, eights, 11, whatever. Uh, but they're gonna be different calibers as well. But a speed loader lets you load the entire count of rounds at one time into the cylinder. Those are great for reloads as well. Push the cylinder in to close it. The gun is now loaded. Pretty simple, easy peasy on that. Unloading a handgun. This will be for a revolver. Same operation in the beginning. Press the cylinder release and push open the cylinder from the opposite side. And then you could use whatever method you want, but we need to turn the muzzle up and press the extractor rod to clear the cylinder. So the reason we turn the muzzle up is so we let gravity help us out on dumping these rounds or empty brass. But we're also going to hit that extractor rod, which is going to pull the brass or the rounds out of the cylinder and let them dump on the ground, in my hand, whatever I'm doing. Now, some people will do it like in the photo, dump them out. Some people will open it and hit it with a hand. Whatever you, whatever you do, uh, you're most likely gonna have to hit that extractor rod to dump that cylinder out to make it clear. 
if it was all live ammo in here and I was just, it was unfired, it's live, ready to go, and I wanted to make this safe and empty, say, so I could clean it, then I could most likely open it and just dump them into my round, uh, into my hand. Assuming the cylinder's clean and everything, they would just dump out. If it's fired brass, meaning I fired all those rounds, then those casings inside that cylinder are probably swollen till they, till they fit tight, and I would definitely have to dump them with that extractor. That's how we do it. We get it empty, and then we safety check it. We look to make sure however many empty chambers or charging holes, as they're called by Smith & Wesson, however many empty holes in this cylinder they're supposed to be, in this case there's six, I'm gonna look and make sure I see six empty holes. I may spin it, take another look at it, six empty holes, make sure it's safe and empty, and that's it. I've safety checked it, and it's clear. Uh, that's a revolver in a nutshell. Does anybody have any questions on that, on the semi-auto or the revolver? All right, very well. All right, so let's talk about some modes of carry. How would I carry a gun? Uh, if you ever encounter law enforcement in an official capacity, we encourage you to advise them if you are carrying or transporting a firearm or other weapon. It's not a, we're not trying to infringe your rights or anything like that. We're just, we'd rather know up front before it becomes a surprise to us. Okay, and the reason I say in an official capacity, if you're passing by us at a restaurant, you know, eating lunch or something, we don't want you to say, hey, wearing a gun, you know. <laughs> you know, if you, get, if you get stopped or something like that, you know, it'd be cool if you let us know up front that you're armed. Let us know without touching it. Um, the, the officer would really appreciate that. Uh, when carrying a handgun in a holster or otherwise, you must consider safety and accessibility. Choose a method that secures the weapon from falling out as well as something that covers the trigger area. It should also be secure from someone easily taking it. Make sure it fits your particular firearm. So be careful about trying to cross up uh, makes and models for different guns and holsters because they're typically they're made specific. Now there are what, what's considered a universal holster out there that'll fit different sizes of different, or the same size of different makes and models. But uh, if, you could, if you could at all help it, that's not the route you wanna go. You wanna find something that's spe specific for that gun, that make and that model. You should also be able to access your weapon safely with a positive grip so as not to draw it or touch the trigger. So here's a good example of that. This is a, uh, this is what's, and there's a lot of different holsters. There's so many of them out there. Uh, this is an example of what's called an inside the waistband holster. And we can see that it, with those clips, it's secured to the belt and it's covering the trigger guard, the trigger area. So no issues on that. That's a good carry right there. And if he's wearing it correctly on the left, which he is, you may never see it. He's got it covered up with a garment. Uh, earlier the sheriff talked about open or concealed carry. The difference on that is, just for a visual, this is open carry because it's in plain view. And then there's concealed carry, which, is mean, which means it's hidden otherwise. Typically by a garment, like this guy with the t-shirt over it, but it could be in some of the other ways that I'm gonna show you, like a purse or backpack or something like that. Um, we suggest, and same thing we do in our handgun permit class, we suggest carrying concealed, okay? Um, everybody's seen law enforcement out before in public in uniform with a full duty belt and they're going on? Everybody's seen that, right? Have you seen the guys out in button down in khakis with wearing a gun, they got a badge around their neck or on their belt? Detective looking, y'all seen those? You've seen the plainclothes guys, blue jeans and ragged t-shirt, but they got a gun on, they got a badge, that kind of stuff. They, they're all identified by some kind of markings of some sort. Have you seen the guy at Walmart in shorts and a t-shirt with flip-flops wearing his gun and it's out in plain view with no identification of who this guy is and he's just walking around? How do you feel about that guy seeing that? Does it, does it raise some hairs? And if you're that guy, I'm talking about you, but we're just using you as an example. It could be a girl, yeah. whatever. But when you see that person, you're like, man, what's the story with this dude? You know what I mean? Does it make you feel a certain kind of way? So 
number one, carrying it concealed will not draw that attention to you. But also, if you're carrying open like this and the bad guy comes in and wants to do harm to somebody or whatever in the place, rob it or whatever, and he sees you got a gun on, he may deal with you first because you may, you may be considered a threat to this guy's plan. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. We don't want to let them know what we got, okay, until it's, if, if it comes to it, then we'll let them know. Keep it concealed, it'll, it'll, it'll be a lot, of, lot less headache, okay? But it's your, it's your right to carry it open if you want to. That's, that's your choice. Unless I'm, if I'm in uniform, it's open. If I'm out of uniform, off duty, it's concealed. You'll never know I got both of them. As I said, both of them. Uh, if I'm riding in a car on a trip or something like that, it's going to be concealed, but I'll uncover it so it's accessible in the vehicle. It's still concealed to general people that may look in the vehicle, but I've got it a little more user friendly, not covered up with, because I got a seat belt and then I don't want the shirt covered up as well. I'll uncover it. But when I get out in public to go in to eat, I'm covering it back up. Does that make sense? Okay, be smart about it. Examples of on-body carry. On-body carry is a device, typically a holster, that's attached to your garment somehow. Typically it's going to be a holster. Top left, this is a outside the waistband holster on a belt. That's real common. He could cover that up with a shirt real easy. Bottom left, ankle holster. In the middle, inside the waistband, this is appendix carry. He's carrying it right here. This is real popular, makes a lot of people nervous. But if you got good finger discipline coming in and out of the holster and a good holster, you can see everything on the gun's covered up that's supposed to be covered up except the grip, which is how he's gonna access the gun. Uh, that's, not really, that's not really fat kid friendly. I can't really wear it like that too much for me. Uh, but uh, bottom right, that's the same guy we saw earlier. And then up top, this is what's called a pocket holster. And this is a holster that covers everything on the gun that should be covered, and it basically fits down in your pocket. And these little ears will retain the holster in the pocket if I draw the gun. Does that make sense? Um, <clears throat> it's not my favorite option, but I do have one of these that I wear quite a bit. It depends on what I'm wearing, shorts and a t-shirt or something like that. Um, I'm going to have something on me. Cutting grass, it don't matter. Come by my house, I'm going to have something on me. But, and that's something else you may, depending on how you're going to carry or where you're going, you may have to change or modify what you're wearing, okay? On that note, I saw this at Walmart the other day. There's, I don't think, let me see if I got a picture. I may have put a picture of it in here. No. Uh, there's something called printing which means if I'm trying to go concealed, let's pretend this is a shirt that's covering up my gun. If this shirt's too tight, it's going to print the outline of the gun. Does that make sense to you? So I got Walmart like that the other day, and my man needed a, a bigger sweater, okay? But he had it concealed and everything, and everything was cool except this sweater was belonged to his kid or something. And... Man, it was so tight, you could lose, like, that's a gun for sure, okay? So if we're trying to conceal it, let's conceal it, all right? So you may have to change a little bit about what you wear, how you wear it. All right, so those were on-body carry, attached to something on the garment, typically a belt. Uh, examples of off-body carry, all right? So the guy on the left here, he's got a little over-the-shoulder bag, a uh, guy on the right has got something similar. And the lady in the middle here, she's got a purse. Now, the one at the top and the one she has, they make purses and bags specifically for guns, okay, with little hidden pockets, quick accessible pockets. My wife has a couple of these. She carries. I taught her how to shoot. It's probably a mistake. But, uh, <clears throat> and you could use some type of bag or purse that may not be made for a gun as long as it has an appropriate compartment or pocket to where it can secure that weapon. Does that make sense? Whatever pocket or compartment that gun is in, that needs to be a dedicated pocket for that gun only. No lifesavers and Tootsie Rolls and car keys mixed in there because how easy could something get inside the trigger guard and set the trigger off, right? 
needs to be a dedicated pocket or compartment for that weapon. But again, there's options out there for everybody. And you, no, no, but don't take this wrong. I'm not saying women can't wear a holster. There's a lot of chicks that wear holsters for sure, okay? This just, I'm just giving you options. There wasn't many pictures of guys wearing a purse on, on the internet. But there's, uh, just like the gun sizes and stuff, there's something out there for everybody. They make binders and day planners and briefcases that have gun compartments and all that kind of stuff. Um, but watch this. Oh, fanny pack, forgot about that. Fanny pack's kind of in, in between on body and off bear body. Um, it's probably a little, a little more permanently attached to us at the time rather than an over the shoulder bag or something. Uh, but again, this is, these are specific fanny packs for guns. Uh, it's got, they have little sleeves and compartments in there that it covers the trigger guard. And that's what we want if we choose to go fanny pack. I've worn that before too. Remember, with off-body carry, such as a purse or shoulder bag, you will need to maintain possession of it until you are able to take it off and secure your weapon. Does that make sense? Now, I'm on my wife all the time. We go to the family reunion over at the house, uncle's house or whatever. She's got a purse. She brings her purse in. She'll come over. She'll set it back there with the rest of the purses. I said, uh -uh. no, you're not. You got your gun in there. Either I'll put it on me and then your purse can stay there or we're going to secure that purse somewhere locked in a closet or whatever the case. You, you get what I'm saying. Don't forget that it's in there because we set it down. It's available to small hands and then it's bad news. Got to be mindful of that. Any questions on that? That makes sense. Something else on open carry. It has happened. It's not unusual for somebody to be robbed of their gun. All right. I go to the quarter car wash at night. I'm in the bay washing my car. I pull my shirt up so I can, makes me feel faster to get to it. Guy comes by, he sees it. This isn't a real story. I'm making this up. Guy comes in, he sees it. So oh, I'm going to get that gun. He comes up behind me. Give me your gun. I'm taking it, whatever the case. So don't let them know you got it. You could get robbed for your gun. You know what I mean? Uh, so, all right, so we know about off-body carry. Make sure you don't take it off and just leave it laying around. Um, also, on these, on whatever mode you might choose to carry this gun, like he was saying, get some practice getting that gun in and out. Now, it could be with an empty gun, preferably to start with. It should be with an empty gun just for the, the movements of how to get it out, whether it's going to be from a purse or a fanny pack or even a holster. When we get our recruits down here, we get them for five weeks, not here, but at the range, we get them for five weeks. And it doesn't matter where they came from, what they know or what they think they know, we treat everybody like they've never seen a gun before. And then we go all the way to the end with some really advanced kind of stuff. And that keeps everybody on the same page. And we do a full, it's typically about a full week, four days maybe, sometimes five, of what's called performance drills. That's all empty gun drills with a completely empty gun and these orange dummy rounds on how to function this gun and make it work, drawing it in and out, making the gun work, reloads, fixing malfunctions, all this kind of stuff. They have to pass a test on that before they can ever go to the range and actually shoot. All right, so, and then the rest of their time is actually shooting live fire. So that gives you an idea of, of the importance of being able to operate that gun and utilize whatever method it is to get it out and be able to access the gun. So get some practice with that. So options for gun storage. Uh, store guns where they are not accessible to unauthorized individual, individuals. An untrained person should never be allowed access to a firearm. Consider storing ammunition in a separate location and or in a locked container so it is not accessible. Children are naturally curious and fascinated by guns. If children are present, it is the gun owner's responsibility to ensure they do not have access to any firearms. So some options for gun storage. Um, on the left, we have a small safe. It's accessible by hand print. It also has a backup for a key. Uh, that size, it would probably hold, you might be able to get three or four different pistols in there. I don't know, depending on what size they were. In the middle, we have a traditional upright safe, gun safe. Uh, you could put a bunch of guns in there, a lot of different stuff. You could lock your ammo in there with it, valuables, whatever. 
And then on the right, we have just a small personal safe. It's not, lab it's not labeled as a gun safe, but it is a safe. That's about a $40 safe from Home Depot. Any of these are better than trying to hide it in a nightstand drawer or something like that. Bottom of a closet. You know, we, we need to find some way to secure that weapon. Now, here's the thing. We want to secure it from theft. If somebody were to make entry into our home, if you live alone or with other responsible gun owners, how you secure it could change if you, than if you had kids or people that you did in the household that you didn't want to get a hold of that gun. Does that make sense? So adjust your level of storage or security to accommodate who's in and out of your house on a regular basis, okay? If you don't have kids and you're living the grown-up life, but you have some friends that come over that have kids, remember if you got guns out somewhere, you got to put them up, okay? Um, I've always got a loaded gun on me. I've got a couple out at the house that are always loaded. I've got some hidden that are loaded. And when we got people coming over with little kids or something, uh, man, I got to go around and start putting stuff up. Where did I? Oh yeah, I got one over here. You know, because I'm not gonna have. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna be that one that lets that statistic happen at my house. Okay. So be mindful of that. When using any type of gun lock, make certain to unload your gun and verify it is safe and empty. Applying a gun lock to a loaded gun can cause a negligent discharge. So this is an example of a cable lock. Uh, we have some on the table for you over here when we get ready to break. <laughs> My assistant will get that for you. But cable locks are great. They're, they're super easy to use and they accommodate a whole lot of different kind of guns. So you can see up here we got a semi-auto on the left top. We have a rifle it's an AR-15 style rifle in the middle is a shotgun on the right is a revolver what we're trying to do when we put that lock on remember first things first we unload it make it safe and empty what we're trying to do is put that lock on to where it disables that gun to where it can't be fired until we take that lock off does that make sense so for example if this was a loaded gun and I wanted, wanted to put a lock on it it's not gonna make much sense for me to put a lock right here could I still shoot the gun and stuff yeah heck yeah so we're trying to disable that gun from working until we take that lock off uh, this is these are some examples of trigger locks there's a whole lot of other locks lock types out there you can look them up online these are real popular the first one I showed you the cable lock and these uh, are real budget friendly and then we're talking about if you don't have a safe or something to lock it up with. And you may even want to put a lock on it inside the safe because somebody may have the combination, somebody in the house may have the combination, whatever the case. But here's the thing about the trigger locks. Again, we, whenever we're putting a lock on the gun, we need to make sure we download it and make sure it is safe and empty because look how this goes on. See how we're about to stick it right through the trigger guard, right next to the trigger? If that was a loaded gun, that'd be super dangerous. So we want to make sure it's safe and empty before we put that lock on. The only thing I don't like about the trigger lock is sometimes because of the make of the gun, it won't let you have the slide locked open when that trigger lock is installed. Uh, because the way the trick, sometimes when you lock the slide open on certain guns, it moves the trigger in a certain way. Um, so it's hard, to it's hard to verify that this is safe and empty. It's locked, but you know, I can't look at it just like that and tell, oh, it's empty. So I like a cable lock or uh, other lock otherwise, like something like this. They actually make gun pad locks. The, uh, the shank on this is rubber coated to keep from scratching or beating your gun up. And you could use this on a revolver, turn it long ways and run it through one of the chambers in the cylinder. You can lock open the cylinder and lock it through the receiver, whatever you need to do. Uh, if you don't have a fancy gun lock, but you need some kind of way to be able to lock that gun up. This right here, it's a regular old padlock, but you're, unless you had the capability to cut that lock off or had the key, got to have the key too. Uh, unless you could get that lock off, you're not going to be able to close that gun and fire that gun. So if I had to lock it up by no other means, I could do this. If I had a standard padlock, but I couldn't get it to fit through this semi-auto any certain way, I'm going to take that bad boy apart and lock the loose parts together. There's no way you're going to fire that gun unless you take that lock off. Does that make sense? 
Uh, just giving you some ideas for stuff. We need, some, we need gun, uh, safe gun storage is what we need. And it's not just children. It can be, it can be teens or even adults. Um, you got to know who's in and out of your house, who's staying with you and stuff like that. And you got to adjust your level of security or storage to accommodate. Uh, never leave an unsecured weapon in a vehicle. I showed this earlier, but this is just a reminder again since we're talking about storage. Uh, use a vehicle lockbox or other method to secure it. Simply hiding it in the vehicle is not enough. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about situational awareness. Um, this is something that we, we uh, thought was important to talk about because it, it's a really part of, it should be a part of our daily routine. So typically when you think of personal defense, you think of physically defending yourself or even carrying a weapon for protection. One of our most important tools, but often underutilized, is simple observation. Situational awareness doesn't require special training or certain skills. Simply keep your eyes up and your head on a swivel. So, eyes up, we know what that means. Got my head up, got my eyes up. Head on a swivel, we tell it to our people all the time. Head on a swivel just means I'm, I'm just looking around. I'm, I'm constantly looking around. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not looking like I'm nervous but I don't want to look like the suspect, but I'm not getting that tunnel vision, just some walking to my car like this. I need to keep my head moving. Uh, we're getting to that. You know what's coming, and I'm gonna tell y'all something that we were talking about when y'all first came in too. All right, so what I wanna know, who's in my bubble and what are they doing? Have y'all heard of a personal space bubble? It can vary depending on what kind of uh, area you're in, crowds or kids, and depends on the people that are around you. Family members and friends, my, I'm, I'm going to allow more people into my bubble. We get out in public, go to Target, Walmart, something like that. My bubble's real big. It's real big. I don't want, don't get close to me. This six foot rule is the greatest thing that's ever happened. You know? But I want to know who's in my bubble and what are they doing? So my bubble for me is anybody that could immediately access me to do harm, okay? Probably at least as far as this guy is right here, at a minimum for me, does that make sense? I'm not super concerned with the dude way across the street or down the street, I might have my eye on him, but I'm really looking at what's immediately right here, okay? I need to be observant of who's, who's close, and man, what are they doing? <laughs> I just saw this dummy out of the corner of my eye. <laughs> so you need, to, you need to really pay attention. Now, I'm not saying that we that we're just judging people or anything like that, but have you ever seen somebody before, and I'm not, I'm not talking about uh, gender or race or and none of that. I'm talking about, have you ever seen somebody before out somewhere It just kind of made you want to keep your eye on them? All right, that's a real thing. That's not profiling, I mean, that's just a real thing. Um, and that's the people we want to look for. And if I see one of them, whoever or whatever it is, I'm gonna keep my eye on them, okay? So just be mindful, simple observation. If we can recognize that something just doesn't look right, then we may have the option to avoid it. Remember earlier we talked about if you could avoid it at all costs, do it. Um, if we can see it coming, man, maybe we can hit it off before it happens. <clears throat> What's one of our biggest distractions every day? Oh, everybody say it. So <laughs> we knew the slide was in here, obviously. So when the first, I don't know, about three-fourths of you came in, I think it was you who said, look at him. Every one of you, except this guy back here. We were, we kept our eye on him. Yeah, we were like, this is the dude with the gun, for sure. <laughs> Everybody except this guy in the gray shirt was like this. <laughs> LOL. Everybody. Now, if you weren't in here yet, maybe that didn't apply to you, but you was probably out there on your phone. But here's, here's the business. That, that's a real thing. That's a real problem today for sure. Sergeant McMacken, Strucker Shields, they used to work in traffic. He's a certified traffic investigator. He's worked a lot, of, a lot of bad stuff. Using a cell phone while you're driving? Bad news? You know, we're... We're not designed to, we use the term multitask, we're not designed to multitask, okay? We can task orient, we can, uh, we can break away from a task, 
but we, we can't do two things at once by the way we're designed. Does that make sense? Unless you're what? Well, uh, yeah, that, that's, that's a fact. They're talking, typing, they're talking, typing, they're on the radio, uh, drinking coffee. But we're, we're not meant to do that, so we need to keep our head out of that cell phone or whatever device it is. This is what, what y'all looked like earlier, except we weren't on a subway. Right? So, something else that's real popular, man, I could tell y'all some stories about my wife and this phone business. What's the, what we got here? Headphones, earbuds, whatever. Whatever they are. Uh, that's another one of our senses. So we're taking our vision out of play. We're also, we can't, can't hear what's going on. Um, my wife, we're getting real close to the end, by the way. <laughs> I got to tell you this. My wife, when she goes to work, on the ride to work and on the ride home, she's on the phone with her mom. They're like best friends. And, you know, I'm, you know, it is what it is. She, she is going to call her regardless. I'll call and try to say something. She will not take my call. So, but then the worst part, what I'm getting at, she gets home, she pulls up in the driveway, and she's still going on the phone on the whole conversation. And sometimes when I'm feeling, I don't know, I'll come out and sneak up around the car and come up to the window, bam, bang on the window. And of course, I got to hear about it for two hours after that. But I'm just trying to make a point to her. Hey, I keep telling her, get off that phone. Okay, you're here now. Get out of the car and come in and talk. Don't unnecessarily just sit in your vehicle, unattentive to what's going on, talking on the phone. I mean, come on. She knows better, but she still does it. You gotta love her. But cell phones and other electronic devices are great, but can also distract us from observation of our surroundings. If you have to access your phone in public, now a lot of this stuff might sound a little overboard for y'all, but if you really think about it, uh, if you have to access your phone in public, especially with your head down, such as typing or, or reading, man, we're always checking our department emails and stuff on the phone, stuff like that, not while we're driving, because we're not supposed to do that. But try to make it quick, but also position yourself where it limits someone's ability to approach you. So if I'm at the Walmart and I gotta get on my phone for something, I'm not gonna stand out here, man, I'm gonna get over here out of the way. I'm gonna check this bad boy real quick, but I'm still, I got my eye on everybody in here. You know what I mean? Nobody can get me from back here. Does that make sense? So, you know, kind of be smart about it. Uh, some other tips for situational awareness, and this is by no means all of them. There's a ton of them out there. You can look this stuff up online. Like I said, I got handouts back there with some websites for you to inquire about some more of this stuff. But situational awareness and safety in general. Uh, keep your head up, look around, and walk with confidence. Uh, we know these, these bad guys, they're looking for easy prey. That's what they're looking for. Make casual. Don't try to stare somebody down. Might get something started. But make casual eye contact with people. This lets them know you see them. When walking through doorways, think of it as crossing the street. Look both ways. You're not going to see many of us walk through a doorway or around a corner or anything like that without checking. It's just, just by habit. Uh, when walking around corners, vehicles, or other obstacles, try to create a wider angle for a better view. If this podium is a corner, it's a hallway, and then I'm going this way, I'm not doing this. Man, there should be somebody right here at this corner. So if I have the available space, I'm going to come out off this dude. I'm going to be looking like this before I come around this corner. And you may say, well, you, you do that at Kroger? Absolutely. I'm the guy that comes out wide on the aisles I'm looking you know what I mean uh, it's just habit for me now but you need to think about that stuff especially in unfamiliar territory going downtown at night going around buildings and stuff like that you gotta gotta really be sharp try to walk in well-lit areas and if possible not by yourself try to take a buddy or several uh, you know if you work late at night or something or coming out even a patron somewhere coming out late at night and they got security or something like that and you, you feel sketchy or some kind of way about walking to your car, ask the security guy. You know, if they won't walk with you, say, well, can you at least watch me? You know, keep an eye on me. So don't be scared to ask for help on that. Uh, if you walk at night, consider taking a flashlight and even a whistle. Now, a whistle sounds weird. I don't carry a whistle. 
If somebody, if you're out walking your dog late at night, if you're the night walker with your dog, you might consider carrying a light so you could see or just for, you know, light somebody up if you, they're in the bushes or whatever. But also a whistle. If somebody comes up and confronts you and you want them away, man, I promise you, you hit that whistle. People are going, man, what is going on out here? You know, anything you could do to draw attention to what's happening. When approaching your parked vehicle, observe what's around and have your keys ready. Don't wait till you get to the car to start digging in a purse or in your pocket or jacket, whatever the case. Uh, most vehicles are equipped with a panic button on the key fobs. Everybody know that? Have you used that before? Um, most of them, you know, you can hold down that. It's a usually red button, but it's got a picture of an alarm or a horn or something. You hold it down and it's going to cause a big ruckus. Uh, a lot of people will keep those next to their uh, nightstand. They could set it off from inside the house if they sense somebody's coming up to the house, whatever the case. You know, the bad guys, they don't like a lot of attention. So when something like that happens, they're hopefully going to try to move on somewhere. Uh, lock your doors as soon as you get in your vehicle. This is a big, this is a big one for me. Even I've developed a habit of that. It took me a while to do it. You know, a lot of, a lot of most newer cars um, have an automatic lock. Once you put it in drive or start rolling and get to a certain speed, it'll lock the doors. Uh, as soon as you get in that car, lock that door. Okay, because a lot of times that's when it's going to happen. Getting in and out of the car like that, get in there, lock it, and then you can start it up, check your mirrors, look around with all that stuff, but get it locked first. A locked door can give you enough time to get away, all right? Uh, when you arrive somewhere in your vehicle, look around before you get out. Take notice of people sitting in parked vehicles or leaning against them. Just people hanging out in the parking lot. You don't need to be hanging out in the parking lot. What are you doing? It's always good to know your location, even if you had to call, if you had to call 911. Try to know where you're at. However, and I just verified this again the other day with somebody in dispatch, uh, your location can be detected even from a cell phone, okay? And depending on how long you may get to stay on the line, it could pinpoint it pretty accurate. Was somebody here in dispatch? Yeah? You know much on that? Sorry. Yeah. Now, from my understanding, they, you, they can get pretty accurate as, as tight as an address of a house um, if they're on the phone long enough and can get that, that next signal that they need, even on a cell phone. So, you know, back in the day, because well, I'm at, uh, God, man, I don't even know where I am. I'm, I'm on a street that, uh, you know, it's got lines on it. I don't know. But now just, you know, feel safe that knowing at least here that they, they, can get, they can get them in the area real close, even from a cell phone if you don't know where you are. Okay. But try to know where you're at. That'd be good. Even landmarks and stuff. I'm at the McDonald's on Poplar or whatever. Uh, try to remove valuables from your vehicle whenever possible. Even if it's cheap, broken, or doesn't matter to you, if it looks tempting, it can lead to a break-in. Okay, something that looks like a cell phone case or a, a Nintendo case or anything like that. If even it's empty, my son used to say, what's empty? I don't care. Hide it under the seat because they're going to break in to find out that it's empty. Um, lock your vehicle whenever you can. You know, anybody on that next door app? Man, my car got broke into again. Somebody else. Well, they break the window. No, nah, they open the door. <laughs> they pick the lock. No, nah, they really just open the door. I don't leave it locked because I don't want to break my window. That's why they've opened your door seven times in the past month because they know hey, this guy don't leave his door unlocked. That's the second time we got him with the door unlocked. Let's get him again and again. You know what I mean? So, man, y'all lock your stuff up. It's, a, and we saw it even when we were out in patrol. It's, it's, especially now, it's super common. They want to go along and they're not looking to do a lot of work. They want to go along and pull on some door handles. Oh, here we go, right here. Rather than break a window and cause a big ruckus. Make it hard for them, lock them cars. All right, so here we go. Share your knowledge of basic gun safety and situational awareness with others. Anything that you've learned today that you think is valuable, share it with somebody. Uh, discussing gun safety with children can be difficult at times. The following could be a good starting point. This is something put on the, by the NRA. It's called the Eddie Eagle Program. I think they started it in the mid to late 80s. Um, 
they've got a character that's this dude on the left that's Eddie Eagle and they make learning about gun safety kind of a fun interesting thing for little kids and if you need some help talking to your kid about that then you know you may look at this and and they got video you can go on the website and you, they got videos and you can order comic books and all kind of stuff this stop don't touch run away tell a grown-up they got that's in a little song that the kids get into and um, it's a good place to start if you don't know where to start with that you know what I mean <laughs> you know given the context of the wording it could you know it could sound different but uh, we, my son learned real early you know my, my opinion on that is if, if they're old enough to understand the difference between do and don't on something then they, they may be getting close to start learning about not touching guns or something like that but to to teach them about not touching a gun you got to introduce what a gun is okay so your, your kid could be different what you got i had seen uh, a couple years ago 2020 had done a program about gun safety for children and they instructed your parents instructed the children not or what to do they saw a gun about 50 percent of the children listened the other 50 percent did not even though they had, they had just been instructed on what to do i've seen that i've seen that uh, and it's, I mean, it's kind of disheartening when you see that because you, you think like, man, this is the answer, but it's not. But it kept some of them from doing it. Yeah. Without that, they may have all done it. Uh, but I, I saw a very similar article on that. But, you know, do what you can. And if they're not old enough or even if they're not responsible enough or whatever, we got to lock them up. Not the kids, but the guns. Okay? <laughs> we got y'all's names, by the way. Uh, so uh, check into that. For additional information and videos on gun safety, gun cleaning, gun disassembly, etc., feel free to access the following. I got this on a handout for you. I've added one that's the Sheriff's Office website that's on the printout back there. But access this stuff. These are places you can go and get more information about gun safety, gun handling, how to take a gun apart, how to break it down and clean it. And these are all legit uh, places, you know, NRA. Midway USA, these, this is not just some dude making videos in a basement going do this and do this. You know, these are, these are for real good informative videos, okay? And thank you for attending and be safe. What you get? Put that on the back of your car to broadcast what potential weapon inside that car. You see the stick figure families on the back of these SUVs and they've got the funny one that's got the long guns and the short ones and all that stuff. They can follow you back to your house and know that you've got guns in your house and you're breaking. So what you're portraying and conveying to those around you as well, be aware of what's going on around you. Makes sense. So keep that in mind too. And thank y'all again. Do you have a you got a question? Yeah, most untrained people aren't going to handle a gun. Say that again. If the family theory right now is most untrained people aren't going to handle a gun, like come to buy first, anybody can handle a gun. How is that going to change? How should that change our outlook? Okay. All right. So real quick, real quick, he's got a question. If you need to go, that's fine. But um, he's got a good question. So he's asking about on july 1st when this law takes effect for it's not it's not technically constitutional carry because there's still some limitations but they're calling it permitless carry where if you qualify uh based on some certain criteria you can carry a gun open or concealed so he's asking how should his outlook change on that so here's the deal kind of what we talked about on the difference between open and concealed you're probably going to see a lot more people and, and we're we're anticipating that i mean that's just what we're expecting but you're probably going to see a lot more people out and about in plain clothes, no markings or identification showing that they're law enforcement or security or anything like that, wearing guns. So I would, I would just say be, ca be cautious of everybody. And especially if you see somebody wearing a gun, it wouldn't hurt to put an extra eye on them. You know what I mean? I, I don't know what's going to happen to the effect of people just going crazy and calling uh, I'm at Costco, this guy's walking around with a gun, just some random dude wearing a gun, you know what I mean? 
I don't know how that's going to affect people as far as how they feel about it, but uh, I mean, it's going to happen one way or the other. Now, I don't know if these. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Totally responsible. That's, that's what they do. This whole thing is, if I if I'm shooting at him and I hit the shoot, you have these people have zero zero business carrying a gun. They're just carrying because they can't they can carry it. I'm responsible. You're responsible. And the, and the thing is, is that if you pull your gun and shoot somebody, even if it's if, even if it's legal, you you've done your three steps. The instructor mines went over. You're still going to, you're going to get taken, it's going to get tagged into evidence, you're going to have to, you know, and it's the same legality that we have to put up on the <laughs> Same thing, you're going to have to put down the protection, you're going to give them your state, you know, lawyers, all that stuff. You're going to, well, you're going to get taken away for a couple of years and put it you know, in a piece of property. Go to a pistol range, know your weapon, know everything, know your rights. The government, you know, the state of Tennessee has written this, uh, that they're going to have to open carry. If we don't know what, it's just, they're just opening it up. They're not, they're not putting anything on their website. So contact your commissioner, sure whoever you need to contact your hand. This is probably just a useful information legally what we're allowed to do and not to do. You know, just be responsible. Common sense will, if you have common sense, you'll probably be all right. Know your weapons, know how to fire them. Does yes, ma'am. Does the open carry still give anybody rights to come into a, a, a building that says no firearms? No, no, man. That's and that same thing is on the handgun permit. The the property or the business will still dictate. Um, I can carry it in certain places, but if I'm going to, well, I'm not going to name a name, but if I'm going in this restaurant and they got a sign posted, um, then I can't do it. I'm not supposed to do it by law. Okay. So it doesn't it doesn't negate that at all. And actually, in, in actuality, with the permitless carry, we haven't seen the whole thing yet. Just heard bits and pieces, but there's still criteria that makes you allowed to carry under that. And you don't have all you're not afforded all the freedom carrying that gun as if you were a handgun permit holder. Uh, like a, like it's if something I read. If it's true, it's not the actual bill, but um, being able to carry in parks and things like that. You can with a permit, but under the permitless carry, I don't. I don't think that's a, a go yet. But we'll find out July first what the actual reading is on that bill. Uh, if nobody has any further questions, I hope y'all learned something today. I hope y'all enjoyed it, and we really appreciate y'all coming. And if you liked it, pass it on. <laughs>